Welcome. We are glad you have joined us to worship on the first day of May, both here in the sanctuary and online. In the Psalms, we read these words. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. We come before God with a holy fear. We are reminded to humble ourselves as we give thanks and praise the Lord our God. Friends, it is good to celebrate God's goodness together. You are welcome to attend the funeral for Mrs. Linda Bradburn this Thursday at 11 a.m. That afternoon, the worship gathering at 1.30 p.m. will be held in the lounge. Let us come, be, uh, let us come before God in prayer. God of all glory, on this first day of the week, you began creation, bringing light out of the darkness. On this first day, you began your new creation, raising Jesus Christ out of the darkness of death. On this Lord's day, grant that we, the people you create by water and the spirit, may be joined with all your works in praising you for your great glory. Through Jesus Christ, in union with the Holy Spirit, we praise you now and forever. God of mercy, you have called us to be thankful for your good gifts to us, but too often we have taken them for granted as if we deserve them. You have called us to be hopeful through the gospel of Jesus Christ, but too often despair has come upon us and the cares of the world has weighed us down. You have called us to be joyful in the wonder of your presence among us, but too often we become mired in the mundane and lose the gift of reverence. By, by your saving power, O oh God, enable us to create your love celebrate your love for us with joy and thanksgiving in the name of jesus we pray amen friends hear the assurance of forgiveness that we uh, we receive in the gospel of john chapter one john says these words to all who received him jesus christ in faith to those who believed in his name he gave the right to become children of God. So friends, though we come before God sinful and in need of grace and forgiveness, God is willing, joyful to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness as we put our faith in him. Know that you are a forgiven people. And thanks be to God. Let's stand together for the opening hymn number 207, Thine Be the Glory. Or 201, thank you, thine be the glory.
there. That feels better. Good morning, everyone. Um, this week, I hear, was not a happy week in the Bruno household. A very sad week, the Raptors lost. <laughs> now, Tim, we know you are passionate about the Raptors. You probably watch all their games. You, do you have a jersey you put on? No, no hat, no jersey? Um, do you allow any interruptions during the game? Uh, no, that, that's recorded, no interruptions, no stealing. Tim, we know, is passionate about the Raptors. But I know there's somebody else, Nav Batia, who is super passionate about the Raptors. We know of him as the Raptors super fan. He goes to all the games. He doesn't just watch the games, he goes to the games. That's what I call super passionate. Passionate, what does passionate mean? When you're passionate for something, well, looking at the definition in the, in the dictionary, it says, when you have strong emotions. Hmm. Now, the Cavalcantes, I hear you have a new puppy called Donut. And I bet Donut is passionate about you guys, isn't he? Does she follow you or he follow you everywhere? Wants to be with you all the time? I bet he's very passionate about you, isn't he? Now, does he want to follow you in bed and sleep with you? Does he bark if you leave him alone? He's passionate about you, isn't he? Passionate. My husband, Larry, if you, I don't know how many of you know him well, he is passionate about learning and books, especially about history and politics. Oh my goodness. I joke with him, he has more books than the Novel Spot bookstore down at Humbertown, by far. He, and oh my goodness, what he knows. I'd say he's passionate about books, passionate about learning. Um, I joke with him and say, I think your head's gonna explode one of these days with all the stuff you know. Like, how can you remember everything? Passionate. When we're passionate, we spend a lot of time and energy on something, don't we? What are we passionate about? This week, um, as uh, others of you who have been reading through the Bible in a year, we've been reading the book of Acts, and I've noticed in the book of Acts, it's amazing as the Christians, as the early Christians were baptized with the Holy Spirit, wow, what a change. They became so passionate. So this week, my question I've been asking myself is, am I passionate about Christ? How passionate? Am I like a super fan like Nav Batia? Or am I just mildly passionate? The Gospel reading this week is from the book of Matthew, chapter 9, verses 27 to 34. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and said, 
According to your faith, let it be done to you. And their sight was restored. Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him all over the, that region. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been mute spoke. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. begin a, uh, a new sermon series on the New Testament epistle, word meaning letter of James. So we start that today and we'll take our time going through the letter. Not following the pattern of today, if you look in the bulletin you'll see the reading for today is James chapter 1 verse 1. Uh, don't worry, we won't take one verse each Sunday for the next 58, or I think it's actually 106 verses in James' epistle. We're actually going to speed up quite a bit next week, but I wanted to take some time today to set the scene in this epistle of James. We had the, uh, the gospel reading from Matthew read just to kind of help us understand the, the genre, the style, the purpose of the Gospels uh, versus the letters of the New Testament. And I'll speak about that a little bit more. But in particular, in that passage in the Gospel of Matthew today, uh, we noted this faith became transformative, right? Jesus asking those two blind men, do you believe that I can act, that I can heal? Yes. 
And may it be done to you as your faith. They were healed. Faith and action. Faith and practice. The epistle of James is so focused on our living faith as Christians. Uh, As you see on the front cover of the bulletin, he's so focused on making the connection. Faith and practice. You say you have faith, let me see your actions, the deeds. Faith that works. So I'm going to read our text for today. It's in James and in the Pew Bible. Um, I actually don't know exactly what page it is, but it's very close to the back if you wish to follow along because there's some interesting introductory words about sort of time of writing and so on. And you'll start to get familiar with this letter, I trust, the letter of James. But I'm just reading the first verse here. James chapter 1. James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. Let's pause to pray. Holy Spirit of the living God, may you enter into our hearts, make us all, receptive to what you are saying this day to the church here in this place. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Growing up, I remember a, a turning point as, uh, as a boy in playing games with my father. I played little board games like Mastermind or Monopoly, and one of the games we played, and that's exactly the box I had, probably a 1982 version of the game Memory. Hopefully some of you remember playing that game. It's been around for quite a while. There's different versions of it, of course, but Memory. The idea is you take the 72 cards in there, you spill them out on the floor, mix them all up, and I used to love that, getting down on the big shag carpet that a lot of us had back then, right? And the the cards all kind of bumpy as you start to spread them out on the floor, face down. And the idea being is you flip a card over, just randomly, any card over, and then you flip another card. And the idea is to find a match. Now, a lot of, there's many different versions. On the next slide there, you can see there's this version, which I, I liked. We, have, we had one version like that, where it was like the parent animal, or the mommy animal, and the, the baby animal. So it wasn't an exact match, but you'd flip over a chicken, and you're looking for the little chick, right? And that's the match. You make the connection, you have a pair, you put it to the side, and then you get to go again until you make a mistake. Well, my dad was really good at teaching me to lose, so he really beat me in in everything. I think he was a fairly competitive guy looking back, so in sports and games like this, he really taught me to lose. But I remember, like age 11, I think it was, when I beat my dad. And then I beat him again, and it wasn't a fluke, and my dad stopped playing memory with me. (laughs) My sister was like that too. They were both very competitive. My mom and I, not not so much. But no, I think my dad continued to play, but it became not as fun for him to start to lose to me all the time. I still beat all my girls, no problem, in a game like this, right? I I don't know. Maybe not. Um, But memory, making the match, making the connection, finding that pair. James really wants Christians that he's writing to, to make the connection. You say you're a Christian. Are you living out the Christian faith? James writes to ensure that the connections are being made in these fledgling churches. It's possible. A lot of us look at the New Testament and assume the Gospels are the first books written and it's chronologically put together, the New Testament. Not so. Not so. James, maybe Galatians, there's a couple other books contesting for earliest written. James might have been written in A.D. 48. 
as early as that, 18 years after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was written early on, and, and these churches that were popping up all over the place, meeting in homes, of course, just small gatherings of Christians, James was writing to them and, and teaching them, ensuring, remember what Christianity is. Remember what Jesus Christ taught us. Are you living the faith? Jesus taught you. Do not love, covet, desire money. Therefore, treat the poor who come into your fellowship the same way you would a rich man. We'll get to that in James' writings. Jesus taught you to care for the poor, the weak, the widow, the orphan. Are you supporting them in your ministries as individuals? Jesus taught us to love one another. Is that love being worked out in forgiveness and grace to those who have wronged you? Faith in practice. James is saying if you call yourself a Christian, act like it. Make the connection. Faith that works. So when we read the different types of writing in the New Testament, know that those Gospels, they're, they're called Gospels, the full title actually originally to describe those four Gospels is the Gospel, which means really the good news according to Jesus Christ, uh, the good, sorry, the good news of Jesus Christ according to Matthew, Mark, Luke. We, we tend to just call them, I'm reading from Luke today or reading from Matthew. So the good news of Jesus Christ according to the, the style of writing, the purpose of those Gospels is really to win people to Jesus Christ. If you look at the end of John's Gospel, I love that ending when he says, these things have been written that you might believe. That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in his name. The evangelists, they're also called, those four Gospels, they, they wrote to win people, to convince people that Jesus Christ was the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. Why was James writing? He wasn't writing to win people to faith in Jesus Christ. He, he wrote to already convinced Christians about putting faith into practice. Uh, recently, uh, Kelly had looked something up online. There was a seminar about encouraging um, girls, high school and youth girls, to consider the trades, to consider going that direction. I, I, I think for a long time, we've really put on, on a pedestal almost university education. You know, that, that youth should all, you try to get to university. If you can't make it, ah, I guess do a trade, go to a, go to a college or something, right? That used to be the case. I think it's becoming a little more blurry that colleges also offer a lot that universities do, and universities offer a lot that trade schools or colleges do. But there's, there's often been, we need to get to university. That's success. It's interesting, right? That dichotomy in that, that seminar was set up to try to elevate the trades and say this is a very worthwhile and actually... Uh, actually quite lucrative profession to head into. It might be the right way for a lot of our youth to start training. Well, James is like that. It's like the trade school. It's like the, the practical college for Christians. Very different than the way Paul writes. One of the other big authors of the New Testament, we understand Paul to have written 13 of the 23 letters of the New Testament. Most of them he wrote. Compare the introduction of, of Romans, for example. You could open your Bibles if you wish to follow along. But the book of Romans, here the introduction Paul gives to the church that gathered in Rome. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. 
The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets and the holy scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong... Jesus Christ, to all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be His holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his introduction. <laughs> that whole theological treatise, if, you could, if your brains could handle all that writing, that's simply Paul just saying hi. <laughs> that's his opening. What was James' opening again? James, the servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds for the testing. He starts to dig in immediately, verse 2, into the practical. Let me tell you how to live this faith. Chapters 1 through 11 in Paul's letter to the Romans is almost all theoretical. Uh, it's powerful. I, I love Paul's letter to the Romans. Don't get me wrong, but it's very philosophical. It's very academic. It's very university. Helping people to think. And th that's very useful. I'm, I'm not putting university down. It can really challenge us, get us to open our minds and consider things and, and be leaders for the future and visionaries, that, that works for some, and many end up being a barista in Starbucks after their university degree as well, right? But, but the possibility is there to be greatly challenged and to open our minds in university for sure. James really isn't offering a university lecture. Hey, I'm James. I'm writing to you Christians, many of whom have been kicked out of Jerusalem because of your faith. Greetings. Let me talk to you about faith and action, about making the connections, about applied Christianity. It's interesting um, when a baby is born. I think we probably all do this, or as that child gets a little bit older, we start to look closely at the face of that child, don't we? Why? We're, we're trying to... That kid, yeah, he's got his father's eyes, you know? Yeah. The, the mom's face, the, the, the lips there. I can see that she looks like her. It's fun to do that. To make that family connection, that resemblance. You know, I, I, I'm a people watcher. I've shared that before, right? I, I love sitting in, in a coffee shop and pretending I'm reading and I'm listening in on people's conversation or watching what they're doing, right? I have that swing chair on our front yard. I sit out there and again pretend to read, but a lot of times I'm just watching people going by. It, and it's fun that at times, especially like Easter or summer holidays, you'll see like a 50-year-old a man uh, walking down St. George's Road, and I'll see a 20-year-old man walking beside him, and, and you, you look at them, and just by sort of the gate, the way they're both walking, it's like, that's his son. <laughs> I know it, you know? I know it. There's, there's a family resemblance there. Or when boys reach that time of life where their voice changes and you're calling to speak to the father and the boy picks up and you're like, oh, hey, Dan, how you doing? And it's, oh, this isn't Dan, it's Tom, his son. You know, oh, okay, sorry about that, that change. But they sound so similar, right? They look so similar. We like to see that in families. James is saying, may we see that in the church of Jesus Christ. Do you look like a follower of Jesus. James is interested in family resemblance. The way we look, the way we speak, the way we act. Does it, does it 
look, maybe not physically, but, but do, we, do we behave and speak as, as Jesus did? Do we resemble our Lord? Making the connections. So who is James? We're not going to spend too much time. There's, he doesn't give me much in one verse, right? But who is James? Most commentaries would say he, because there's a lot of James to choose from in the New Testament. Lots of James. Apostles, there were two, and another one mentioned in the New Testament. But James is also the eldest brother, half-brother of Jesus. And I would suggest that's who this James is. Half-brother of Jesus. I say half-brother because I believe Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. Born of God, born of Mary. James, we understand as Protestant Christians and according to the Gospel writings that, that actually Joseph and Mary had several children. Jesus had half-brothers and sisters. James was the eldest of his brothers. James was probably one of the brothers who sort of made fun of Jesus in the, in the midpoint of the gospel, saying, hey, you, you seem to be pointing to yourself, or people are thinking you're something special. Why don't you go into Jerusalem and let them know who you are? Kind of provoking Jesus. James didn't believe right away that Jesus was the Son of God, but he became a believer a servant of God, and you'll note in that opening line, James is a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Very humble, not, not a servant of God and half-brother of Jesus, of Nazareth. No, no, no. The Lord, kurios, Lord Jesus, and then Christ, Christos, Messiah, Savior. James quickly became the leader of the church of Jerusalem. We think a lot about Peter as being the head of the early Christian church, and, and he was, but Peter started to go beyond Jerusalem. James was the head of the, the big city, the holy city church in Jerusalem, equal, perhaps greater in authority even than Peter. Paul called James a pillar of the church in Galatians chapter 2, and yet James says, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who's he writing to? He's writing to the 12 tribes scattered throughout the nations. The 12 tribes. James in particular, much more so than Peter and some of the other apostles who began to share the gospel to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, James really only shared, we understand, with Jews. The gospel. Fellow Jews, this Jesus is, was, will be the Messiah. He's writing to the Jewish believers, Christians scattered among the nations. They were persecuted in Jerusalem. We can read about that, as Colleen mentioned, if you're reading through Acts, about how the, the Jewish Christians were scattered to far nations. James is writing to them, continuing to shepherd, to care for the flock. Greetings, he says. Greetings. That's it. And then let's get working. And then he starts to teach. I want to close our just opening thoughts, reflections on this book um, just with a, another image, kind of like the memory image. But you've visited perhaps, um, you know, the zoo or certain carnivals, festivals where there's those poster boards, big boards set up with holes in them, right? And, you know, you can stick your face in them. And, and sometimes it's really fitting. I don't know if you can see it well from there, but the, this little boy and a girl, and it, and it looks really fitting. It looks like they fit. You can almost not see the gaps. But sometimes, in the next slide, you can see it just doesn't fit, right? You have this Hawaiian dancer and then this guy with a goatee. I mean, it, it just looks terrible, right? You can, you can see this doesn't fit. I remember getting one of those done with like this muscle-bound guy and my skinny little head in the hole above, and it was just, you know, laughable. But when we do these, part of the point is the humor, right? The family or your friends take a photo and tuck it away into a memory file, and you can laugh about it. What are we laughing at? We're laughing at the inconsistency, that I'm actually not a muscle-bound man. It, it's, there's no real 
connection there, right? I'm, or it's goofy, or it's a fish, and you have the child's face, and it's funny, and it's cute, but there's, there's a great inconsistency there. It's hard for our minds to do this, of course, but if somehow we could see the church, St. Giles Kingsway, the spiritual body of Christ, we're called that in the New Testament, you are the body of Christ. If, if we could have a poster board with us, St. Giles Kingsway, not the building, we have to try to get that out of our mind, but us, somehow us as the, the body of Christ, the spiritual body, if, if somehow that could be depicted on a poster board. And then if Jesus put His face in that hole, would people laugh at the inconsistency? It's hard, right, for us to kind of bring that to a philosophical plane when we have those physical pictures in our mind. It's hard to break from that. But, but when people who come to this church and when our church goes out and people know we are the church of Jesus Christ, do they look at us and see no connection between how we speak, how we act, how we think, and the way Jesus Christ taught His church to speak, think, and act? Do people laugh at the inconsistency? Dare we call ourselves the body of Christ if, if we look nothing like Christ and what He taught us? This is James' passion. This is his passion for those fledgling churches, for the church today. We must look like Jesus. As we dig into James, this writing, may we be challenged to more and more resemble our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you a grateful people. We have so much to be thankful for. To live in a country of, of relative peace compared to much of the world, we give you thanks. 
Most of us, perhaps all of us gathered here, have suitable places to live, have plenty of food to eat. We have friends. We have family members who stand by us. And for these things, we do give you thanks, O God. For the community of Christ, of which we are a part, both globally and here, locally in this place, for St. Giles Kingsway, for the faithfulness of elders and leaders throughout the decades of its history, we do give you thanks, O God. We give you thanks for the written Word of God, the Holy Scriptures, and how by the action of your Holy Spirit, you are able to make your Word come alive in us to produce good effect that we might better go out resembling You, our Lord Jesus, and how we act, how we speak to others, even how we think. We are thankful, Lord God, for this place of worship. We're thankful for the opportunity to join together in in worship with those who are not able to physically be present over these last two, two and a quarter years. Lord, we give you thanks for this ministry. Lord, we lift up to you those who are grieving at this time, those who have lost a loved one, those who are remembering an anniversary, a birthday of of the loved one they have lost at this time. We, We ask you to be very present with them by your Holy Spirit. We pray for those who are awaiting surgery, those who are struggling with anxiety or fear, Heavenly Father, meet them where they are. We lift our hearts and prayers to the the global scene. We think of those who live in steady fear of bombing, of attack. Oh God, we pray for peace. Grant wisdom to authorities who are able to intervene and make a difference. Heavenly Father, we think of places in the world where there is such extreme poverty places of famine and drought. Oh God, it can be overwhelming and can actually lead us to not do anything. So help us as a church community and as individuals to know in what ways we can make a difference to to truly be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus in the world today. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the facing of these days. O oh Lord, for the many prayers that are being lifted up at this moment, for ourselves and for others, we ask you to hear them, to respond according to your good, perfect, and pleasing will. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen.
powerful hymn, the reminder, take all of us, Lord, use us for your glory, the building of your church. Friends, may we go out making the connection between how we live and our worship and our understanding of Jesus' call to our living. May the grace of Jesus go with you. The love of God surround you. The Holy Spirit guide you this day and forevermore. Amen.